We've all heard about salts in walls and how they cause damp, but also how they cause meters to overheat. Now I'm going to talk to you about some of those salts, where they come from and what they are, and how we can identify their presence and if they're causing a problem or not. Sometimes using a moisture meter, we'll find that the meter overreads, and now and again it's inexplicable. It could be foil on the wall, although that's quite rare and very obvious when that happens, if there's foil behind the wallpaper. But usually it's attributable to salts. And that's why, for instance, on a profile where there's some rising damp, often a surveyor will find, when using his moisture meter, that he's getting highish readings up the wall, and he may even get a slightly higher reading before the readings fall off again. And that's the salt band. And so actually, whilst electronic moisture meters get some stick in the press and from various quarters that they overread with salts, that in itself can be useful for a, a qualified and experienced surveyor. Because if the salts, if it's overreading where you'd expect it to overread for certain reasons, then um, that's helpful for his diagnosis. However, if we're going to look at something from a forensic point of view, and we need to, for example, produce a report either for use in court or because the consequences of misdiagnosis on a particular job are really bad, you know, it's expensive, it's a big job and there's a lot at stake, then we can use gravimetric methods. And because gravimetric methods involve removing samples um, and using samples of the masonry to establish whether there's hygroscopic moisture there, um, that's a useful tool because if we are getting a high or a, an excessive hygroscopic moisture content in a sample, then we want to know why. Now we know it's probably salts, but it would be a good idea to then just see what those salts are, because that might give us a clue as to where they came from. Now what we do with this is we use various chemicals. There are test kits you can get, you can use test strips. Um, I don't favour those myself because what does 200 parts per million mean to you or me? Um, not a lot, uh, because there's no actual agreed method and different materials absorb different amounts. What we're really looking for is the type of salt and its distribution in the wall, where it's been concentrated, because that will be the point of evaporation. In other words, where all the evaporation is occurring, you'd naturally expect most minerals to be left behind, because that's where most water has evaporated. Okay. So if we're looking at a profile, a gravimetric profile, and for instance we've got a hygroscopic moisture content of 1%, uh, 1.5%, 2%, 7%, 7%, we'll then take that sample out, we'll grind it up, make sure that we've got it down to a powder, and use some simple deionized water, uh, nice clean water with no salts in it, to basically dissolve the salts. And we'll leave that for a day or two in a solution. Sometimes you can speed the process up if you want to stick it in a, a, a Bunsen burner under it and boil it, you know. Um, I don't do that myself. So we'll do that. So now the salts are suspended in that water. And by adding certain chemicals to that water, we'll promote chemical reactions. And we can see by the precipitates that are produced what kind of salt it is. So for instance, if we use some silver nitrate and nitric acid, um, we can establish if there are chlorides present. Now, there are chlorides present in all building materials because tap water's got chlorides in. However, the amount is so infinitesimally small that it won't even show up. Right? So basically, if we take a sample from a clean wall that's not had any contamination, it's not going to show up as, with chlorides. If, on the other hand, we get so many chlorides that we precipitate out a chalk-like material at the bottom of the test tube, and often that's the case, we'll get a test tube and literally you can see it it's appeared from nowhere, it was a clear liquid, I've filtered it through a filter paper and now we've got this solid material. That's a massive amount of chloride and what it tells you is it's been concentrated there from some source. Now a leaky tap could potentially do that and what you get is round the tap you'll see this white crust you know all the way around. It doesn't actually do it in the ground and the wall because obviously once it's in the ground it's groundwater and it's distributing around. It shouldn't be getting wicked up the wall in order to form a salt band and if that's happening that's rising damp and if you can fix the leak but you won't actually stop rising damp, you'll just lower the amount a little bit so you might control it a bit. Sensible to fix the leak obviously, yeah, you know. Um, but walls shouldn't be sucking water up, uh, but they do unfortunately, especially older walls. So chlorides are an important indicator. Now if you're finding a lot of chloride, you might also find a lot of nitrate. 
And it's the same thing, nitrates and chlorides are present in, in the ground because that's where tap water comes from as well. But there tends to be a lot more in the ground than there is in tap water because the, there are limits on it. In fact, you tend to find more chloride in tap water than you do nitrates. So again, we can do a test with that. And we use sulfuric acid, we use concentrate and dilute sulfuric acid combined with ferrous sulfate, and that's known as the brown ring test. And what that does is it precipitates a little brown ring at the surface between the concentrated and dilute acid. And that tells us again, and it's the strength of the ring. Sometimes it's like tar, sometimes it's barely discernible. And that gives us an idea as whether well there's nitrates and chlorides in a wall. So salt analysis is useful, but often what it's merely doing is confirming that the salts are at work because we've seen they are at work with the hygroscopic moisture content that we've got from our gravimetric testing. So it's really useful to do this. I would say salt analysis has fallen out of favour a little bit over the past few years, um, but there are no actual good reasons for that. The, it's, some say, oh, there's no point testing for these salts because they're in tap water. Well, they're in groundwater as well. So... <laughs> If you've got a leak that's so bad that it's rising up the walls, you know, you've got a, 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 you're losing pressure on your heaters, this, that and the other, it's pretty obvious. Subtle little leaks do not cause long-term rising damp. Um, they may contribute to it, but you've still got an underlying rising damp problem. And if you've got rising damp, you will find you'll get accumulated salts. And if you drive down any street of any village with nice old houses, you will see that salt band even in the side street where a salting vehicle, you know, a, um, a road salting vehicle has never been, uh, it's never been gritted, you'll find a salt band, particularly in summer months, you'll see that. And that is actually the efflorescent salt. Usually in cold weather, just above the efflorescent salt band, you'll see a darker area, and that's where the hygroscopic salts tend to congregate. I hope you found this introduction to salt analysis useful. If you want to find out more, why not give us a ring and we'll talk you through the process.